Okay, so last time I talked about what what materials do, specifically the sort of clear insulators like glass and water and uh, plexiglass that uh, that light can propagate through. And, and as, as light goes through, it makes electromagnetic uh, fields. And specifically, the electric fields are the relevant ones because these materials aren't particularly magnetic. Uh, and and the, the charges in these materials are bound. And so as an electric field propagates through, the atoms of the material uh, deform a little bit. And the electrons and, and protons get pushed around a super tiny amount, but it affects it affects the field inside uh, of the material and it affects, as we'll see today, how, how waves propagate. And in order to deal with this, we made a bunch of definitions, which are kind of all annoying to keep track of, but let me, let me just write, write down the things that we, uh, that we, uh, we had from last time. So, so there, there's this um, D field, which is epsilon times E, E is the true microscopic electric field and epsilon is some dielectric constant, kappa E, some dimensionless thing times epsilon naught. So epsilon naught is just the, uh, the constant that appears everywhere in electromagnetism. And this is a sort of order one factor or maybe order two for, for glass and water. Uh, and the idea here is that the D has to do with the, the field that would have been there if the material were not present. If all you had were free, free charges that you could control. And in, in free space, as these waves are propagating and in media, there are no free charges. There are not capacitor plates that we're forcing an electric field. Right? The, the only free charges that we might worry about are in, in the source of, of light, like inside of the laser, uh, or in a detector, which we're not going to really analyze at this microscopic detail. So, so D has to do with the free, free fields, uh, you know, the, the fields that would have been there if, if the material were not there. And, and similarly, um, but kind of slightly oppositely because of the way uh, materials tend to reduce the electric field, whereas they tend to increase the magnetic field, we define, oops, uh, we define this new field H, which is also the kind of version of the magnetic field as, as if uh, only the, the free currents were around. And, and B, the actual honest to God microscopic magnetic field is, is slightly altered because you take your free field, uh, say you have a coil, a solenoid that's filled with vacuum and you put some, some material in it, you know, liquid oxygen is really the only, uh, the only material that behaves in the simple way that we're describing here. Um, and the, the uh, spins in the liquid oxygen line up and they serve to increase the, the actual honest to God B field that you were to measure. So in some sense, D and H are uh, uh, a little bit mathematical constructs, but they're, uh, they're very useful for, for this, this, uh, this analysis. And, and similarly, mu is some magnetic constant that's, you know, really for all the materials we're used to, this is really super close to one times mu naught, which appears everywhere. And if we look at Maxwell's equations in, in media, like I said, D has, has to do with uh, just the free charges. So instead of divergence of E equals rho over epsilon naught, the divergence of D equals just the rho free oh, uh, of over nothing because the epsilon is already sort of contained within the, within the D. And this is all for linear media that, that behaves in this sort of proportional way. Uh, and the divergence of B is still zero. Faraday's law is unchanged. Minus partial B, partial T. And Ampere's law gets written in terms of uh, both D and H. So curl of H is J free, the free currents that you can actually control with external wires and things, 
plus partial d partial t. And um, when I say, it, this is a little bit confusing, the, the word free means things you can control in free space where there are, where there are no charges that you are controlling. Um, these things are, are gonna be zero in, in free space, which is different, maybe a different use of the word free. So don't, don't get those two things confused. Um, free as opposed to bound charges. When I talk about row free, it's the, the charges on the plates rather than the bound charges in the, in the material. And J free is the, the free currents as opposed to the little microscopic uh, kind of effective currents that, that the spins can, can make or orbits of electrons can make. All right, so well, these are our basic set of, of Maxwell's equations, very, uh, including these definitions and pretty straightforward trans translations. Oh, what's nice is kind of by using this, all of the constants that normally appear in Maxwell's equations kind of get absorbed into the definitions, which you know, depending on how you feel is either makes these look simpler or you know, makes them look like there's someone's pulling a fast one on you under the hood. Um, let me talk about the pointing vector, the, the power per area that's, that's being transmitted. So this is sort of what we really care about is when I shine a laser at something, how much power is actually going from here to there and in what direction. And in these, in these units, it's pretty simple. It's just E, or not in these units, in these, uh, for these definitions, E cross H. So in the sort of physics 51 type definition of the pointing vector, there was a factor of mu, mu naught here, which then just gets absorbed in the H. Um, and this properly takes into account any energy that's stored in, uh, in, the, in the material itself that can come out the other side. And the intensity, which is what we'll normally calculate, you think about the, the intensity as a, uh, just a watts per square meter, say. Um, this, is, this, is the, this is defined as the magnitude of the time average of S. So, so S for a wave is a little bit, uh, is not particularly useful because E is waving around really fast. H is waving around really fast. And for, for light, really fast means on the order of femtoseconds, way faster than anything we can actually measure with electronic detectors. And so when we calculate the intensity, when we actually hold up a, a camera with an with a, uh, electronic sensor or a film sensor, or we hold up a little photodiode, which some of you played with in an electronics class that, that actually responds to the intensity of the light, it's not fluctuating back and forth on femtosecond timescales. It's just responding to the, the power averaged over some, some brief window of time. So normally you average, over, um, you average over one full cycle of a wave or at least enough full cycles of a wave to, to, catch, uh, to catch the overall behavior. But you don't have to average over such long timescales that, that you're uh, not catching the behavior you're interested in. So, so say you're blinking, a, blinking an LED a million times a second and you, you have a detector that, that can be sensitive to megahertz blinks, then averaging over, uh, averaging over times of the actual oscillation of the electromagnetic wave, a femtosecond is 10 to the minus 15 seconds. Whereas your LED is blinking uh, at a megahertz or a gigahertz say, so one, uh, yeah, one megahertz is 10 to the six hertz or 10 to the minus six uh, seconds. You know, one, one cycle per 10 to the minus six seconds. And the gigahertz, which is sort of some of the fastest detectors can go up to a, a, a few gigahertz. That's 10 to the minus nine seconds. So, so if you average over a few of these femtosecond cycles of the electromagnetic wave, there, there's you can average over quite a few of those and still get 
um, extremely fast changes that you're capturing in the intensity. But we'll see an example of that in a second when we actually talk about the, the waves. All right, so, so let, me, let me solve or let me manipulate these equations and get, get uh, uh, an, an equation that will pretty obviously spit out waves. And then we'll analyze different types of waves and, and uh, do some other stuff. So, so let me, I'm basically gonna repeat a procedure that I did a, a few lectures ago with the, the equations in free space, but here I'm gonna do them with, with, these, uh, with these definitions of, of uh, electric fields and magnetic fields in materials. I'm gonna start with Faraday's law again. So that hasn't changed. Minus partial B partial T. I'm gonna take the curl of both sides. So this is the curl of the curl of E. Oh, my. I did order new markers, so situation will improve at some point. Um, and I can move this curl inside of this partial because partial derivatives commute. Curl is just a bunch of partial, partial spatial derivatives. Here's a partial time derivative. So this is minus partial, partial T of the curl of B. Okay, um, I'm gonna use a vector calculus identity. So on this side, if, if you just work out component by component, you know, it's, it's some amount of work, but component by component, if you work out what, what all this stuff is and you suck it back up into, into vector calculus notation, you'll see that for a generic vector, this, this equation is true. So this is the gradient of the divergence of E minus the Laplacian of E, okay? And here I'm gonna exchange B for H. So mu, especially for all the materials we care about is it's basically just mu naught, but it's still just a constant. And so I can exchange B for H and I'm gonna, I'm gonna write this as minus mu partial partial T of the curl of H. And then now I'm gonna use Ampere's law here in, in free space where I have no, no external currents. And so this becomes minus mu two partial derivatives of D. And I'm gonna use my definition of D to give me a factor of epsilon here. So this is minus mu epsilon D squared d squared of e. Uh, oh, and on this side, if I'm in free space, my uh, divergence of e is just proportional to the divergence of d, which is zero if I'm away from charges, free charges. So I, I could be inside of a material where there are bound charges, but that's that's okay. I'm going to replace d with e, and I'm going to say there are no no uh, no free charges here. So this is this, this goes to zero. So now I just have minus Laplacian of E. All right, let me rearrange this equation a little bit. I'm just gonna solve, sort of move things over to the other side. So two time derivatives of E is one over mu epsilon, two space derivatives of E, Laplacian of E. All right, so, so again, just by units, these are two space derivatives and these are two time derivatives. So this constant here has to have dimensions of space squared over time squared in order to, since E has the same dimensions. And, uh, and this, this thing here is, is the speed of light in the media. So this is gonna be uh, squared, sorry. Speed of light in the media squared. And that's, that's not the speed of light in vacuum, that's the speed of light in vacuum C naught over the index of refraction. And remember C naught was just the same thing, but with mu naught and epsilon naught. So now we can relate, since we know what epsilon and mu are in terms of epsilon and mu naught, we can relate um, the index of refraction to the electrical quantities that we can measure by setting up capacitors and stuff. And what we find is that N, uh, 
and I'll write it up here. And, and the index of refraction is just the square root of kappa epsilon, uh, kappa mu, I believe, yeah. So remember kappa or kappa m. So remember kappa m is, is almost always just one. So it's really just the square root of the dielectric constant. Um, so, so if the dielectric constant for, for some material was, was two, like it you know, sort of is for uh, some, some glass and plastic type materials, then, then N is gonna be roughly the square root of two. Okay, so, so this, is, this is just a wave equation for, for waves in media. But let's, let's actually talk about what, uh, what, what kinds of solutions this equation can give us. And this is where things you sort of have to think about uh, narrowing your focus or broadening your focus. So this is a pretty generic wave equation in three dimensions. And basically any, any wave you can uh, validly construct in three dimensions is a solution to this equation. And so throughout this class, we're gonna focus on different, uh, different specific kinds of waves that, that can propagate. So I'm always gonna be specializing and you're always gonna ask, well, you know, how generic is the thing you're talking about right now? And I'll try to be pretty careful about how generic the thing I'm talking about is, but I'm gonna kind of focus in on one thing and focus in on something else and we'll, we'll hop around a little bit. And I, and I think that the first time you see a lot of these optics, uh, if you just kind of poke your head up above water and say, where, where exactly am I? Um, it's important to realize how specialized we are. Like what, what is a requirement of this wave equation and what is just a specific solution we happen to be focusing on at the moment. So let me give you some examples here. Uh, let me see, what else do we need? I think we might be, I think we might be done with the, the Maxwell's equation stuff. So I'm gonna erase, I'm gonna erase this. And then we're gonna talk about some specific, specific examples of, uh, of solutions to this equation. And eventually we're gonna um, kind of pull back and take, start taking superpositions of those solutions. Because even though I just erased it, all the Maxwell's equations are linear. So if you have a solution, any superposition of solutions is, is also a valid solution. So that's why we can, we can afford to specialize to, to quite specific things and, and then pull back and, and generalize to quite general solutions later on. All right, so the first, the first family of solutions I'm gonna focus on is, uh, is uh, uh, well, I'll, I'll just write down what the form is here. So, so E in general depends on three dimensions of space and one dimension of time. And I'm gonna specialize to it it being just some vector constant out front that, that has no space or time dependence. So we'll worry about what the properties of that constant are in a second. Um, times some function here that depends only on x minus ct. So, so if I think about plugging in this equation, um, if I take two time derivatives of this, this is just a constant. So two time derivatives are gonna bring out a minus C and a minus C. It's gonna bring out a, a C squared on this side. Um, and, and I'm gonna be left with two derivatives of this function. Now, well, let me just do this here. So, so I'm, gonna, I'm gonna plug it into this equation. So, so the left-hand side becomes the same constant, E naught. Um, I'm gonna get two derivatives of F, F double prime. Derivative of what's inside is minus C. Derivative of what's inside again is minus C. So that's C squared. And on the right, I have a C squared and I have two, two spatial derivatives. So this from the Laplacian is two derivatives with respect to X plus two derivatives with respect to Y plus two derivatives with respect to Z. Now there's no Y or Z dependence. So all I need to do is take two X derivatives and two X derivatives is just also gonna give me this constant back times F double prime of what's inside. And the derivative of what's inside with respect to X is just one. 
do it again, I get a one. All right, so, so this is factor C, C squared's cancel, and this is true. I, so, so this, for any function f, satisfies the wave equation. So, so how, have I how have I specialized? Well, I've specialized in that all of the spatial dependence is just in the x direction. And, and what does this look like? Well, if, let me just imagine some, some function here. So this is, this is x, and this is some function. I'll just draw a weird looking function here. This is f, f of x. So this is, you know, imagine this is like a snapshot at t equals zero. As, as time progresses, so say this peak happens at some particular x, as time progresses, in order to ask where that peak is, when, when time goes up, x has to also go up in order to, to keep evaluating the function at the same peak. So that means that as time, time goes by, this thing's going to move to the right. And what does this look like in three dimensions? Well, in three dimensions, this looks like a wall of something, you know, whatever, whatever this constant vector is. There's just a wall of it that has some thickness, maybe delta x in x. And if you're if you're here looking at it, you're you're you you're experiencing no electric field, no electric field, no electric field, and then for some some brief amount of time, you're experiencing a pulse of electric field. And it doesn't matter where you are. If you stand up here, or if you stand down here, or if you stand in, in or out of the board, you will experience the same pulse. Because as a function of y or z, this, this particular solution doesn't change. So this is, this is a plane wave. It's a whole plane of electric field with whatever thickness profile you want moving at the speed of light, so say you know, say you're in a material, say you're underwater, uh, moving at the reduced speed of light in the water, uh, coming toward coming towards you. So that's that's one one solution. But that's that's not usually the the solution we care about when we talk about uh, when we talk about plane when we talk about plane waves. So so for any function, this this will work. These are valid solutions. Often, what we care about in in optics are uh, are not not just generic plane waves with some generic profile that can be as complicated as you want, but plane waves that are uh, that are one one color. So they oscillate at one frequency and have one wavelength. So I'm going to further specialize here to to those uh, monochromatic plane waves. Okay, let me erase all this. So a lot of this should be a review, but pretty soon I'm gonna I'm gonna lift lift the kind of simple intuitive way of writing monochromatic plane waves into this complex number notation, which maybe seems uh, um, I don't know. It's like why why would we do that? Why would we Sacrifice some nice simple thing for for complex notation, but uh, well, as as many of you have probably seen in quantum mechanics class, where complex stuff is is required, oftentimes it's easier to work with complex quantities than with than with real quantities. It's easier to work with complex exponentials than with sines and cosines. I'm going to be really careful about what I mean by complex stuff because unlike in quantum mechanics, where the wave function is is complex by by nature, the electric and magnetic fields are, are real things. So anytime I do anything with complex numbers, I really have to be very careful about what, what I mean by that and you know, what, what, what aspect of it is a mathematical trick. Okay, so this is a generic plane, plane wave traveling specifically in the x direction. But I can also write down a solution to, to the equation that's even more specific. I can sort of specify the shape of this thing. R T. Uh, let me write this as some again some sort of vector constant here. Cosine of all right, I'll be pretty explicit about it here. Two pi x over lambda plus two pi time over frequency 
plus some phase offset phi. I think that still barely shows up on the screen. Some phase offset phi. There we go. All right. So it, this is in terms of a real honest to God frequency in Hertz. So every time T advances, so say, say the frequency is, uh, well, you know, in, in reality, the frequency would be one over a femtosecond for, for light. The frequencies are very fast. But uh, let's, let's pretend we're, we're not working with optical light, but with radio waves, a little bit easier to talk about, where the frequency is like a megahertz. Then every microsecond that passes, so megahertz is 10 to the minus 6, every, sorry, 10 to the 6, every 10 to the minus 6 seconds that passes, this cosine advances by a full 2 pi. So you go from peak to the next peak, or from trough to the next trough. And lambda is the wavelength here. Every time x advances by one lambda, this cosine will advance by 2 pi. It'll go from one peak to the next peak, one trough to the next trough. And uh, normally, we don't, we don't like carrying around all these 2 pi's. So, so we define two quantities. We define k as 2 pi over lambda. And we define uh, omega as, oh, sorry, I did this wrong. So it should be 2 pi, 2 pi t times f. So sorry, lambda is in meters. So you need meters over meters to make it dimensionless. Time and frequency are opposite. So uh, we define omega as 2 pi F. And then we can just write this as cosine of kx. Uh, I meant to make this a minus here too. Sorry about that. Minus. Uh, I had to write in my notes. I just screwed up. Minus omega t plus some offset phi. OK. And this, this is a, a monochromatic plane wave. So it's one, it's one color. It's one wavelength. It's one frequency. Um, and you know, this is clearly an idealization because whatever constant this is, it exists going to exist everywhere in space and for all time. And there'll just be infinitely big walls of, of uh, peaks coming at me and then infinitely big walls of troughs coming at me. And so this is an approximation of something like a laser beam that's been really spread out. So if, if you have a camera and all you care about is what's happening at the camera, if you spread out the laser beam to be much, much bigger than the camera, then what the camera sees is roughly uh, a plane wave that looks like this, as long as as long as the source is really far away. So uh, this is kind of an idealization, but it's it's a, a more more restricted than this generic function. Here we have a whole function's worth of shapes to pick for our walls of stuff coming at us. Here we have just um, parameters we we can pick, and in order to still be a solution to the equations. It, it still has to have this form. So this still has to be a function of x minus ct. So I can imagine factoring out, um, so k, kx minus omega t, I can write this as kx minus omega over k t. And that fixes the relationship between omega and k. So in order to actually be a solution to the to the wave equation here, in order to take two time two time derivatives and two space derivatives and have the have the factors of c cancel, omega over k here has to equal c. So this fixes a relationship between the honest to god frequency in hertz and the uh, wavelength in lambda. Uh, okay, so. 
this this specialization is nice because things like lasers tend to be pretty good approximations for monochromatic plane waves. Now, as the course goes on, we'll really dive into what is the spectrum of a laser really. It's not quite a single color, but it's extremely close to being a single color. So it's a pretty good approximation for, for uh, the, the, the wavelength and the time dependence of a laser. And again, like I said, if you spread out the laser beam to be big enough compared to anything you care about, it's a pretty good approximation for the spatial structure. Uh, and, and here they're, uh, yeah. All right, so let me, uh, by way of all this, let me just say, from now on, we're mostly gonna talk about complex versions of these plane waves. And while I'm, I'm erasing this, let me sort of step back on my, my soapbox a little bit and say, um, the, I think this is something that sort of historically has, has been confusing, even, even for me, I often get myself in, uh, in, uh, in trouble by forgetting exactly what, what is the relationship between the, the complex numbers that we're gonna be throwing around and the, the real quantities that, that actually exist. And uh, sometimes it almost doesn't seem, seem worth introducing all this complex notation, but then other times I realize how incredibly useful it is. So uh, let, let me just say it outright here. You know, all, all of the things we care about, E, E, B, D, H, you know, S, I, all these quantities are, are real. So even though I'm gonna talk about complex versions of these things in a second, ultimately they, they are all real. Um, but why do we even bother with complex stuff? Well, basically trig, trig identities are, are harder than manipulating complex exponentials. So I can never remember all the random trig identities that you have to remember. I often have to look it up. Whereas when I multiply exponentials and things, it, I, I almost never have to think about it. So mathematically, it's much easier to deal with complex exponentials for, for many reasons. And, and we can write cosines and signs as sums of complex exponentials. We can write real things as sums of complex things. We just have to be careful about, about uh, always doing it in a consistent way. So, so where are we gonna go here to make our lives easier? Well, I'm gonna use Euler's formula, which hopefully you should all be used to by now. E to the I alpha is cos alpha plus I sine alpha and E to the minus I alpha is cosine is even, sine is odd, minus i, sine alpha. And from here, I can always remember if I just add or subtract these things. So let's, let's say I add them. I'm gonna get e to the i alpha plus e to the minus i alpha is two cos alpha. And I can solve for, solve for cosine. And I can always write cosine as a sum of two complex exponentials. And everything we're gonna write is gonna be a sum of something plus this complex conjugate. And the reason is if you have a generic complex number, x plus i, y, and I add its complex conjugate, x minus i, y, I always get a real number, 2x. So everything we're gonna write is always gonna be a sum of something plus its complex conjugate. Um, and so let's do that with, with, this, with this e here. Uh, in fact, I'm just gonna do it right here. So if I solve for cosine, I'm gonna get a half of the positive exponential. So let me see here. So E naught, um, a half of the positive exponential E to the plus I, KX minus omega T plus phi, uh, I'm gonna run out of room, plus, plus E naught, a half e to the minus i kx minus omega t plus phi. All right, now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this, this phase offset phi and I'm gonna kind of 
factor it out of this complex exponential. So this, this sort of goes to, I'm, I'm getting at some definition here. So it's kind of totally arbitrary. So let me see here, e, e naught um, times a half times e to the plus i phi. And then what's left over is e to the plus i kx minus omega t. So now I don't have to worry about the offset anymore. It's, it'll come here. Uh, plus e naught times a half e to the minus i phi e to the minus i kx minus omega t. All right, and I'm going to call this constant here e naught, the little parentheses plus. I'm going to call this constant here e naught, the little parentheses minus. All right, now because I've included this phase here, these these little constants are are complex. So the phase of this complex number just encodes the the phase, you know, the starting point at at x equals zero, t equals zero. Well, let me go back to the cosine here. At x equals zero, t equals zero. Am I at the peak of a cosine or the trough of a cosine or somewhere in between? The phase of of this constant encodes that information. You know, the phase at the origin of space and time. And also note that e plus is just the complex conjugate of e minus. So I only need to keep track of one of these and the other one comes along for the ride. In fact, that's true of the whole term here. This whole term is just the complex conjugate of this whole term. So I only need to keep track of one of these and the other one comes along for the ride. And so uh, from now on, we're gonna write a lot of our, our electromagnetic waves in this, in this notation. So, um, let me here, let me go here and write write it a little bit more explicitly. All right, so um, so e so this this monochromatic e has a function of r t. This is a real quantity, so I can write it as e e naught plus um, e to the plus i kx minus omega t plus e naught minus e to the minus i kx minus omega t. Or I could write this as this, um, oh, the thing I just erased. I could write this as two times the real, real component of just this first term. Now plus e to the plus i kx minus omega t. So so far it seems like I introduced a bunch of extra notation, but you know at the end of the day e is real, and so I'm only going to keep the real component of this first term, which is the same as keeping the sum of those two terms. Uh, why why is this why is this even useful? Well. What's, what's important to know is that we're going to use linearity. So, uh, well, we're going to use two, two principles. One is that if I have an equation like, uh, like Faraday's law, say E equals uh, minus partial derivative with respect to time dt, if this law is true, if, well, if an equation is true, then just by math, the complex conjugate of this equation is also true. So uh, if you have any equation that's true, its complex conjugate is also true. So that's sort of fact number one. So E cross E star is minus partial B star partial T. So yes, E and B are real, but if I were to pretend E and B were complex, um, for this equation to be true, this equation is true. And maybe if you want to insist that E and B are real, well, then this is true just trivially because the complex conjugate is the same. So you don't have to worry about that. Uh, that's sort of fact number one. 
But fact number two is that all the Maxwell's equations are, are linear. So if we can promote this equation to a complex equation, right? If it's true, well, if it's true for the real part, it's true for the imaginary part also. So if I let, uh, uh, how do I want to say this? Uh, I were to imagine if I let E equal some E, E real plus I E imaginary, right? If, if the equation is true for the real part and the complex conjugate of the equation is also true, I could add and subtract these equations and get an equation that applies just for the real part and just for the imaginary part. Or I can get an equation that applies to E and its complex conjugate, or I can get an equation that applies to um, you know, one of these terms and the same equation will also apply to the other one of these terms since they're complex conjugates of each other. So using the linearity of the Maxwell equation allows me to, to break it up in this way. And so far we haven't really seen the advantage of doing that. But uh, let's, let's sort of say, why, why is this even useful? Well, we'll uh, where do I wanna, I'll erase all this stuff here. Sort of getting, give me the point in the, just a second here. The reason why this is useful is that it's a lot easier to take derivatives of complex exponentials and it's a lot easier to multiply complex exponentials together than it is to deal with sines and cosines. You don't have to worry about any of the you know, derivatives of derivatives of cosines are sines and derivatives of sines are cosines and there's always some sine SIGN that comes in. Um, and multiplying sines and cosines together is always a bit of a pain. You have to remember the trig identities. Doing things with complex exponentials is much, doing those two operations with complex exponentials is much cleaner. So, so we're going to break, break these, uh, break Maxwell's equations down, not into equations for the real part and equations for the imaginary part, but equations for a complex E and B and its complex conjugate. So what that means is that, and, and you can just test this, each of these terms individually satisfies satisfies Maxwell's equation, satisfies the wave equation. These are a lot easier to work with. And, and let me just sort of give, give an example of that. So, so the time derivative of e to the, let's say, so we'll almost always be working with this first term, which comes with a minus i omega t. This just brings out minus i omega and you get the same thing back. So in sort of math, more mathy language, this complex exponential is the eigenfunction of this derivative operator with that eigenvalue. It gives the same function back with some, with some multiplicative constant. So this is nice. So all of, in Maxwell's equations, all of the time derivatives just turn into multiplying by minus i omega. If we're only gonna solve for the, the first term and then know that the second term is just the complex conjugate of that first term. Um, and similarly, there's uh, there's a relationship for space too. So in this example, I have a uh, wave that's propagating purely in the x direction, but more generically, I'm gonna right. So so you know, I'm gonna pull back a little bit. So this was quite a specific um, cosine that just changes in the x direction, but uh, I'm gonna pull back a little bit and I'm gonna say that uh, I, I wanna consider now E pluses, which are functions of R and T that, uh, that have some, some constant here, E naught plus some complex, complex number that encodes both the direction and the magnitude and the phase of, of this, wave, and then e to the i, some vector k dot r minus omega t. 
So this is some, if I were to draw this out and I'll, part of your homework is to animate some of these things. If you have a vector that's, if your K vector looks like this, then what you'll see is you'll see um, complex numbers that are changing in phase, but they're gonna be propagating the, the sort of, uh, the place where they're real and positive will be propagating in this direction, in the K direction. And the, the bigger K is, the smaller the wavelength of these complex waves are propagating in this direction. And uh, well, I've, got, I've got only a few minutes left. So let me, let me stop there and we'll, we'll pick it up here next time. And we'll spend a lot of time analyzing waves that look like this. We'll, we'll look, uh, we'll plug them into Maxwell's equations. We'll get a lot of properties of them. Uh, and on the homework, you'll do some, some plots like this, some animations even, to some two-dimensional animations of plane waves going in various directions to get, a, to get a feel for this. And then eventually we're gonna pull back even more and consider first superpositions of just a few of these kind of waves, like uh, in a Michelson interferometer, where we're gonna send in a plane wave and it's gonna split and we're gonna recombine it. So we're gonna have superpositions of two of these kind of waves. And then as we go through the course, we're gonna be more and more general. So, so this is specific because it's uh, the shape of this wave is infinite planes that are propagating in some direction. Now that's not particularly uh, generic. So, so we wanna consider other shapes that are propagating and then, you know, even later, these are all waves that are all oscillating with a particular frequency and time. So they're all exactly one color. And we'll, we'll generalize to superpositions of lots of different colors and ask what happens, what happens to those when you, for example, send them through an interferometer. And uh, that, that will take up the bulk of optics, basically, you know, until we get to the part with, with quantum optics. Um, starting with these plane waves and then generalizing by uh, considering more, uh, considering superpositions of these in space and then considering superpositions of these in time, uh, that, that will be where we go. And it's kind of interesting optical phenomena that, that result in interesting things you can calculate and interesting things you can do and interesting experiments that you can analyze. We'll sort of take up most of the, the rest of optics until we get to the quantum part. Okay, so I, I didn't hear much in the way of questions. I hope I didn't blow you all away. I, in some sense, I hope this was uh, slow enough that uh, it all sort of built up and made sense. But uh, I, I guarantee that at some point I, and so therefore probably you will be like, wait a minute, there's this complex number. What's, what's really going on? Well, you just have to remember that we're only gonna be dealing with this first term. So you can think about it as what's really going on is this first term plus its complex conjugate, or at the end of the day, you can just take the real part of this first term and multiply by two. Either way, you get, you get the true honest to God real electric field. All right. No questions, I will uh, stop the recording and uh, work on posting homework project three. Okay, see you on Friday.